Good to go, bro. Awesome. Rock and roll. Am I close enough? You are now. <laughs> okay. To sit on this thing. Yeah. T today I'm interviewing uh, the founder of JS Strength and Performance, John Sharp. John is someone who's, who's mentored me over the years and someone that I've worked with before. And I think he's probably one of the more talented presenters that I've, that I've seen over the years and usually goes into full, full nerd mode. So hopefully, really? hopefully today we can get, get some of that nerd, nerd <laughs> mode out and we get to a few, a few gems of information. But before we get into the weeds, can, can you just give us a bit of a snapshot of who John is and where who you- Who John is as a, a snapshot. Where, 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 <laughs> where you started in the industry and, and yeah. where you are now. Um, so fitness wise, I actually got into personal training because I had a girlfriend at the time that wanted me not to work nights because I was in hospitality. Yeah. So I thought, oh, personal training, that'll be how I get a bit of a day job in a nine to five. Yeah. Um, and here I am almost 10 years later. So um, that's how I got into it for all the yeah. wrong reasons. But um, yeah, along the way I started P teen and then um, I had some pretty good people I was working for initially and they mm -hmm. took me down like the rehabby road and then... Uh, as we kind of progressed through it, I met a lot of people who had started influence me back into more strength and conditioning. Yeah. And so here I am, like I said, 10 years later, where I'm working with a mix between rehab, weight loss, and athlete groups, especially martial artists, which is kind of my passion. Yeah. 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 But you've you've obviously had a a, a big background in education, and you've you know you're someone who strikes me as you learn a lot. You're not just going and applying stuff. You you do have a lot of science to back you up how did how did you initially get that i guess learning passion to to back up what you you were doing in terms of your career yeah for me it was i was always one of those kids i failed horribly at school right so like my sixth form we, I, I grew up in new zealand right so yeah my second to last year of school i failed most of the courses so i had to repeat with the kids younger than me okay. and i always kind of had that thing where you know on my report card it said john is smart but does not apply himself and i was like why well, something's wrong with like i'm trying but this stuff's boring and i'm just not interested in it yeah. and then i later down the line i got interested in these topics being health and fitness and wellness and rehab and this was something that kind of kindled this little mm. or sparked this little flame in me and was like this shit's interesting i'm keen to learn about this yeah, yeah. but i it naturally started progressing to this and then I took the sidestep of learning how to learn and I think that's a big kind of thing that a lot of people miss out on is they don't actually take the steps in thinking about how do you learn effectively like how long should you be studying for what should your environment be like how do you take notes how do you create mental imagery or something along those lines mm -hmm. so that's the stuff that really sparked this for me over the years I think learning how to learn but also suddenly getting into something that I'm generally interested about and then it's just been a roller coaster since in terms of yeah I you know did post postgrad work masters and I've done a lot of courses with a lot of great mentors over the years, as you mm. know, like you know, for um, Buckley, Poliquin, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Czech, I've done all those courses, all the lines is, yeah. and um, yeah, it's, um, it's kind of led me to where I am today, but still, you're always the student, yeah. unfortunately. Yeah, and what, what, what do you reckon it was? I had a, a guy, Andrew Reid, on the podcast, and I think it, for, for me personally, it resonated for me as well, was I was always interested in fitness because of watching those early 80s 90s action movies and i was sort of heavily influenced by you know arnold sylvester Stallone. was was that something that got you interested in it what was the not initial thing that sparked not at all um I, I went the other way i was like i was really sporty at school and then um like i love rugby but i never i'd never been in a gym in my life before i started training six months before i became a pt basically okay um oh, so wow. for me getting huge only that was never my motivating factor like i was more the party guy right so after yeah. you i traveled as soon as i finished school i was off overseas and traveling for okay. two years and yeah. doing all those sorts of shenanigans and i came back and my first undergrad was actually marine biology oh wow yeah because i was like i like science i knew i like science yeah and then why i kind of forgot is fitness and that's why i suppose it does quite well what i do today because it's the science and the fitness mm. um but is, is that where you learnt, I guess, how to learn when you got nah, into that or not? Nah, not there. Like uni again, I, uni I did really well. Like I, like I said, I struggled at school, but uni I did really well initially because mm. I was like, this is interesting and I want to I wanna work, I want to apply myself. But then it became quite, it was the same system like, here's your information, here's your book, go away, regurgitate the information in an exam and that's pretty much how we're going to learn. 
Yeah. That's inverted commas, which you can't see right there. Yeah. But um, that's okay. We've got the video. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, cool. <laughs> um, and yeah, it just doesn't work. Whereas I find the, the beauty of like personal training and strength and conditioning is you get to learn a bit of information, but you're, you can technically apply it right there and then. You know, you don't have to wait for anything, especially like assessments and rehab and training protocols and lifts. Like you get a, once you get a bit of information, you get to see it in practice almost immediately. Some things you have to wait for, like progression and results, mm -hmm. um, nutrition intervention, something along those lines. But a lot of the stuff, as soon as you learn it, you should be applying it. Mm. So I think that made it a lot easier for me because I was learning and then applying straight away versus having to kind of wait. Yeah, yeah, that makes yeah. sense. So when, when I first met you, I think it was in 2013 at FMA certification, you were teaching there. And I guess that was my sort of first experience with FMA and obviously Mark Buckley's work, but you were, you were teaching that course. And I guess for me, what impressed you initially was when you were what teaching. What impressed me or? No, impressed me, <laughs> sorry. Was, was you just your, impressed me the second I saw you, mate. Yeah. <laughs> was the, the, the way you delivered it, you kind of, you knew all the stuff and I, I guess you had it in your mind, but it wasn't, wasn't dry and it came across very, I guess, interesting. I guess my question was for you as a, as a teacher and educator, where did you get, because I mean, you, you're a coach mm. firstly, and I guess that's how you describe yourself. But for me, when I first met you, you seemed more of an educator. Was that, where did you learn those, those so this, skills? This goes back to exactly what I was talking about before. Like in school, it was all, there's a sit system, right? Which mm. is, here's your information, you know, we'll spew it out at you, go read chapters one through three. And um, then I remember going to uni and I had one lecture uh, uh, in um, chemistry class and he was trying to talk, it was biochemistry and he was talking about right, ribosomes and how they connected and like the, the cellular function of a cell. And he got up on the desk with these little balls and started running up and down the desks, you know, and talking about trans transcribing um, in the cell. And that's something that always stuck with me because I was like, why was school never like this? Why was someone not doing things over the top or making it visual? I'm a very visual learner or kinesthetic learner by doing versus just spewing information out <clears> of me. <throat> so that's something that when I took away from that, I was like, if I ever teach, that's how I want to teach. I want, I want something to stand out so it's, it creates like an image in someone's brain that mm. they will walk away kind of having a far clearer idea of what that actually means versus just words on a piece of paper. Yeah. 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 So that's why I think I'm like that. Yeah. And, and also your ability to, to recall studies and, and make all of them up facts because <laughs> you'd be like we'd be talking about something and then you'd like reference something and for me you know I, I you know pride myself on reading and educating myself but to, to have that ability to recall stuff like where, how, did, how did you get that I was in teach so I also used to teach um like TAFE, so Cert 3, Cert 4, Diploma yeah. of Fitness, Diploma of Sports Development. So I taught that stuff for a while. So I think it's a lot easier when you're teaching because that stuff's constantly mm. in your mind. It's fresh, right? Um, you know, you're, you're reciting as you run through lecture slides or something along those lines. You might be going, here, there's a paper that, you know, looked at the difference between a keto diet and a zone diet and looked at the difference in weight loss. And so those names are fresh in your head. Also, because, you know, you're doing your master's and stuff like that, you're constantly having to recite papers. So maybe the timing was just right because some of them I remember far more now, some of them far less. It's mm. um, constantly having to teach that stuff that makes it always available yeah. in your brain. Yeah, well, I guess the, the highest level of retention is after you've, you've taught. Absolutely. I guess if, for you, being an educator, that's easy for you to remember. Maybe that's your, your thing. Maybe that's my thing. Yeah. <laughs> so get, getting back to, you mentioned a couple of your mentors earlier can you just talk about doesn't have to it doesn't always have to be directly linked to uh strength and conditioning and what you do now but i guess who who were the guys that influenced you initially and it doesn't have to be from the strength mm. maybe pick one outside maybe it's for business or just gotcha. as a leader yeah yeah i think um it's hard to pinpoint there's definitely some major ones that stick out like buckley um, mark buckley who runs fma awesome course he has a plug for fma if anyone's interested in yeah. it great course for personal trainers um he he was one of the standout guys initially having said that though i think at different phases in your life different people become mentors for you mm -hmm. so there's the standout ones that you kind of remember 
but I think like business, I learned nothing really strong about business from him per se. Not that he might have been trying to teach me that stuff, but that's not where I got a lot of my business information or marketing from. Hmm. So I think you have different mentors along the way and I've had quite a few through courses. So um, yeah, I, I kind of think, I suppose that Depending on where you're at, what's, what's, the, what's the saying? When the student is ready, the master will come. Yeah. So if you're looking for certain stuff like nutrition information, you start putting your feelers out there with that sort of information, then those people generally come to you. Mm. For me, over the line with nutrition, I've never had one. There was a lot of self-study, but that's not to say guys in the industry like John Barati or any of those type of guys that are standouts, like I haven't learned a lot from. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So not sure if that answered your question, but... No, it does. It does. And, but I think also you were something that they were looking for whether they identified talent in you or that you were just hungry to learn but I think a lot of people say they want mentors mm. and they might not get like you worked closely with Mark and then you you taught under his course how, how did you get that initial foot in the door with him I've always been like keen so I remember the first PT job I ever went for this is how I actually met Mark um, so I got a job for RMIT University a, a place called City Fitness and I went for a job interview there and they asked me what kyphosis was and I have no idea what kyphosis was at the time mm. and I just finished my cert 3 cert 4 but we didn't really cover it in detail at the time so I was like I don't know and I'm as soon as I finished the interview I went away and I researched what kyphosis was and I found exercises for it and then I emailed the person who had interviewed me and was like cool this is um this is what it is this is how I apply it this is what it means and then she um was hosting courses with Mark Buckley and like she mentioned things like that he's a guy that goes away and you know will do the additional work if he doesn't know the information and I think that's something that maybe stood out for him because when we first met each other we didn't actually like each other really nah he thought, I thought he was like a bit of a show pony he had yeah. his peroxide hair he had Rachel Guy strolling one arm rolling down with his like all blacks jacket on or yeah yeah and he used, to, he used to wear those leather oh, uh, wristband things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because I had, I had his videos, and this was in like 2013, I was watching it. I was like, who's this guy who's got the oh. barbed wire tattoo? <laughs> and that peroxide and spiky hair. I mean, come on, mate. Yeah. You're not 14 anymore. No. Let it go. <laughs> but yeah, um, so I think that's how I got involved initially, because it was just that, that thing, which is mm. what I look for in people, which is you might not have the answer, but you're going to try and make yourself better. You're going to improve. So it's not yeah. where you're at per se. It's that, that hunger to learn or that hunger to better yourself. Yeah, yeah. So it's probably a really long-winded way of telling you that. but No, no, that, that makes sense. And in terms of is there anyone else that you look up to yeah. now, not, not necessarily, doesn't have to be related to, to strength, but in terms of leadership or the way you coach or the way you run your business? Yeah, for sure. I was lucky. I work for also a youth development um, program called ESS Performance. That was one of the things. And there was an awesome guy there who still mates with today called Neil Wynn, who um, was a basketball coach. Actually, you know Neil yeah. as well. Yeah. And just like his different ways of managing people and his kind of um, attention to detail. So if you've ever worked with Neil before, like he's... He's right into it. Like mm. this guy is a professional at the highest level. Yeah. Um, so yeah, there's bits that I've learned from him, and this is kind of what I meant before. Like I've taken bits from everyone, and I've kind of made my own. I forget how the Bruce Lee saying goes. I'm paraphrasing here, but it's like, accept what is yours, discard. Dis accept what is useful, discard what is not, and m make what is usefully your own, or something along those lines. Yeah. So I feel that's what I've done over the years, where I've taken the best bits that I feel from the coaches I've met. Yeah such as Neil, such as Mark, such as other people that I might have worked with. And um, yeah, kind of gone, I like this bit of their style. I didn't like this bit and this is how yeah. I'm going to run my ship. Yeah, but I, th I think that's good and that gives you credit because you're not just being a clone of what someone else is and you see a lot of guys that might have studied under Poliquin or, mm. and they just yeah. follow one system yeah. and it, it becomes, yeah, like you'll be trying to apply principles to an everyday housewife that you should be applying to a, an elite athlete. Totally agree. Yeah. Yeah, we've got to be careful of um, having, like you have your respect for someone, but it doesn't mean they're right. You should be able to question anyone. And I, I let my guys question me. I want to be questioned because I don't know all the answers. And sometimes just because someone seems quite smart or is in a, you know, a place of kind of stature we are afraid to question them mm. and I feel for a lot of gurus in the industry that is the case and so 
yeah, we should understand, as you mentioned before, we should understand the principles so that we're not copying someone else's methods, which you hear me yeah. say all the time. Yeah, exactly. And I, this going on to like you now being a mentor and you running your own business here and having people work for you. And I think you've been mentoring for, for I don't know, five or six, probably more more years now. Yeah, right. Yeah. What, what, what do you look for when you, when you see a new coach? And we talked about this just before offline. Uh, when you have someone come in and attend your course, what, what are the things that you're looking for that, that you say, this, this coach, I want him to work for me? T- twofold. Like, I've made mistakes before where, like, you, you took a punt on someone. There's kind of two ways of going about it. So to answer your first question, I, well, this is what I mentioned before where it was like, I look for people that are hungry to learn, that have those work ethics, because I always used to say to myself, like, there's certain things you can teach, there's certain things you can't teach. Like, if someone's not book smart or whatever, I can help them with that. But there's an attitude of how they communicate with people, their, their energy, their persona. You can't teach that stuff. And then I got into, like, belief systems and NLP stuff a couple of years ago. Mm. And now it's like, is that true? Or is that an element that I've been limiting people that I can kind of help them with now. So on the flip side, I've got a coach at the moment that's very intellectual, but in terms of communicating with people and controlling a room and his energy, it's very, very low. He's a massive, massive classic introvert. Mm. And so for him to come out of his shell is a huge problem. So now I'm trying to develop him in those areas. Mm. So I think I've pigeonholed a lot of the people that I've taken on over the years by putting them in boxes and saying, you need to be good at X, Y, and Z. For my idea as a mentor or as a leader, as a coach, is to go, here are your flaws. How can I improve that or inspire you to be better in that particular area? And I haven't always done that well, but that's the thing that's kind of come to light for me now, that if I'm really a good leader or mentor, I mm. should help you develop your weaknesses, not tell you what you're good and bad at per se. Yeah, but that, that's that's good because, I mean, you're, you're only going to learn that by making mistakes and pigeonholing people, but now you can actually identify that as, as something that you can improve. What specifically with with that coach that you're talking about what what strategies how how do you coach someone to get out of that get out of the way of themselves i the first part is kind of understanding where their blocks are and this is just the art of communication so sitting down with someone go cool what are the problems that you're having um there's a great book called flow by dr chick sigma height i'm definitely not saying that right because it's a nice russian name Check yeah. Sigma Hyde. I'm going to run with that. Anyway, yeah. that's his name for now. It's called Flow. And um, yeah, it talks about like, you know, you should have a clear goal. So for these guys, and the task should match their abilities. So that's a big one. I feel if for these people, for example, to inspire them and motivate them, I need to create flow for them. So put them in a state of flow, which is mean they enjoy it. It's not like too much. For a lot of people, I think throwing them in the deep end is the mentality that we used to have where it's sink or swim swim, where it's like cool what can this person handle right now what kind of instant feedback do they need to help progress them along the way so for example for this guy it's setting him tasks i feel he's capable of that and i'm sitting right by him constantly giving him feedback because these are kind of the checkpoints that this dude runs through Mm. and trying to create flow for him because that's that's when you kind of inspire that's when you're enjoying something it's not too stressful Mm. but it's stressful enough that you kind of like you're enthralled by what's going on yeah and does he is he have is he self-aware of that that we totally run through that I, I it's something that he's very aware of that he's lacking i think most people should know what their weaknesses or if someone points them out they're like yeah that's that's something i suck at basically yeah, yeah. which is what we kind of talk about with him and then the little side bit though is unfortunately this guy suffers from a little bit of anxiety as well which isn't helping the process yeah but um yeah i think it's not it can be made worse by how, how you kind of teach someone yeah, or yeah. the task that you give them and that's why it's important to create the state of flow yeah yeah and then so what if, if you were to generalize i mean because you would have seen heaps of coaches over the years where do you think generally most coaches are lacking in terms of their communication but also skill sets as well as a coach oh this is like this is the general class, one there's that classic question in like um snc like what book should i be reading yeah. or, or tell me a good resource yeah. don't like there's no right answer and as soon as people understand there's no right answer you you start looking right because mm. i feel like where should someone be going they should take the time to analyze themselves or get someone to analyze them and seek feedback and determine where their weaknesses are and then from that 
that's the area that should try to grow. And for a lot of PTs, you know, commonly it's it's business, for example. That was my weakness for a long time. Mm. Um, but for <laughs> others, it's actually really understanding nutrition or rehab. And I think there's so many holes that mm. it's, hard to it's a really long, yeah it's, yeah. it's like the truth is, like even now, I'm still learning about rehab. I'm still learning about nutrition. I'm doing courses now, like still. Mm. Like I'm in here for almost 10 years. I've been teaching for, like you said, five or six. But as soon as you realize that you will always be the student and it never ends, mm. instead of looking for this end goal, what we're always looking for, like uni used to be like, oh God, I can't wait till uni finishes. I can't wait till this thing finishes so I can get <clears> it done. <throat> but now when you kind of structure it a different way and go, I'm that, I've got that hunger to learn, you're constantly trying to fill those gaps. And mm. I feel that's what personal trainers should be doing, not trying to get to an end point instantly and go, this is my big gap. Just go, cool, I've got lots of them. What do I need to focus on first? Because I'm going to continually focus on all of these for as long as I'm in this industry. Yeah. yeah. Does that, we, no. want, we want instant gratification. We want instant results. We want instant awesomeness. But um, I think this is a lifelong process yeah. as opposed to a short-term thing yeah and i think we we're just watching your business uh from social media but also from knowing you before i went to dubai is that you you're a coach's coach a lot of trainers a lot of pts come and train with you what what do you think appeals to to coaches and why why do you think they come and seek you out probably my good jokes yeah yeah which have i'm, I'm not sure about that one <laughs> <laughs> um no i think it's it's a I don't know. Like I used to think it's just about results. Mm. I, but what I've worked out now is like I had a plateau with one of my lifters. She's a, the power lifter. And um, like I think the difference is instead of going – I've done this before, right? Constantly learning from mistakes. The first girl that ever came to me and was a power <coughs> lifter, like I had, none, I had no idea about power lifting. I was basically just using like a weekly undulation method with her and it worked really well, not because I was any good, because she was a naturally awesome lifter, mm. right? And then the thing from that is I failed so miserably, miserably on it because I didn't, I didn't have anywhere to go. I didn't have enough knowledge, right? Mm. Um, I had information, but I didn't actually have knowledge, which comes with experience. So I was trying to s share information with her and it took me so far, but then I hit a sticking point. So to answer your question, I feel like I learned from my mistakes and I'm not afraid to fail. So if I fuck up, which I often do, it's mm. like... Instead of going, oh, I'm terrible at this and this is the worst thing that could have happened to me or anything along those lines, I'm like, cool, what did I do wrong here? And like the skill that I mentioned before that's kind of hit a plateau, it's like, cool, let's take a back step, stop flogging a dead horse. Mm. What are you missing? What are the principles that you're missing here? So for yeah. her, like I'm trying to take it back and build weaknesses in the back line and stop actually doing lifts anymore and try to build more volume to build her upper body because she's been stuck on a plateau for a bench for like six, seven months. Yeah, yeah. So to answer your question, I think it's like I, my general interest to progress you is very real. I will do whatever I can, whenever I can. I might not always get there initially, but if I fail... I will try to get there again. Yeah, because you go away and research, do the do the work, and they know that about you. Trial and error, buddy. Ho hopefully. Um, so, can you just if if an athlete walks through your door, doesn't necessarily have to be an athlete. We'll just call them a client. So, whether it's an athlete or a client, what what is the process that you put them through? What 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 can it a client expect yeah um depends on what program you're going into because we've got like small group training we've got semi-private and we'll go from like a pt perspective so the pt perspective is now if it's like personal training or semi-private model the whole idea is a phone interview first right so I talk to you about it and i actually understand what motivates you what are the problems what are the things that you've tried before can i even help because the first thing i need to decide is if i'm the coach for you because mm -hmm. it works two ways i'm not I'm not that hungry to take on just anyone anymore. I want to take on people that generally want to help themselves. Mm. Right? And that, that goes twofold. Someone could be semi-keen, but it's someone that is prepared to like, listen to my advice. Okay? Because some, not everyone's motivated by the same things. Re readiness to, to learn. So once we've kind of gone through that, then I'll send out forms that are most relevant for you. Some might be more injury-based. Some might be more uh, holistic-based. So like, what are your sleep cycles like? Your circadian rhythms. Um, some are more around mental health and, um, I shouldn't say mental health, but mental wellness in terms of like, you know. Um, Self-image. and Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So to answer your question, like once I talk 
to someone instead of having a set form. I've got a basic form, but then I, I've got all these individual ones where whatever I think is going to be your biggest sticking point is what I want to start working on. Yeah. Okay. And then so you come in here and then your assessment changes based on that. So say someone's got a musculoskeletal issue or it's a rehab or patella tendonitis or whatever it might be, then I'm going to run through like muscle testing. I'm going to run through range of motion assessments. I'm going to look at exercises that aggravate you and then I'm going to try a protocol like exercises that I think might help that to make it better. Whereas mm. if someone's got problems with adherence or nutrition is a really good one, then our first talk is all about what, what can you commit to and what's going to work for you in terms of a nutrition plan. So to kind of answer your question, this is why I think it's really important to never stop learning and have as many things as you can mm. because there's no one system. Everyone's no. looking for the FMS or the this system where I go from point A to point B to point C. It shouldn't work like that. It should work like, what does this person need? What do I need to pull from the top left-hand corner, the bottom right-hand of the shelf, and then you know come together yeah, for this yeah. individual? Yeah, and then so if you're working, like you mentioned before, just say they might not be able to afford the, the one-on-one aspect of coaching and they want to go into, say, your group classes, then how do you... There's a plug for my group classes, buddy. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> I'm interested more from a selfish reason, but it, in terms of like what assessment protocol would you put them through to qualify them for the, the classes that you're doing? Yeah, again, it comes through. So say you've got no injuries, like I ask you and you're on this form and you've got zero injuries, you just want to lose weight, um, you've been training a little bit before so you've got some background, then I don't need to run through the whole process. Mm. I mean, the lifts, this is what I learned from Mark, the lift then becomes the assessment. So someone does a squat, I can see that there's something wrong with the squat, I take them aside, I look at tail accrual, tail accrual joint mobility or hip mobility or something along those lines and I problem solve on the spot, which is just the quickest way. Yeah. yeah. Um, flip side of that, if someone comes in and, you know, has, talks about maybe knee pain or what, what's a good one? They talk about low back pain. Low that's back. probably that's a good one, yeah. So a really common one, low back pain. And it's like, cool, this is where we run through the form and it's like Otis, onset diagnosis, diagnosis, intervention, severity. Like onset, what pisses it off? Have you had a diagnosis on it? Yes, no, cool. Well, you've had a diagnosis on it and it's a disc bulge all of a sudden. Then I might run through a slump test. So it's like just seeing how bad it is because I don't have to diagnose any of these. It's outside my scope. But I can see how... Um, how bad it might be or is it, is it pro provocative if we do any flexion type exercises um, and then I would run through some extension protocols to see if that actually alleviates the pain or to select exercises that will drive extension or centralize the disc or decompress the disc whatever it might be to alleviate symptoms for that individual so again I suppose I'm not really answering it to say but like it changes every time but the general rule is Muscle testing, range of motion assessments, nutrition assessments, um, adherence and mindset assessments, and then someone gets into training. Yeah. So to answer yeah. it in a simpler way. Yeah. <laughs> and I guess it comes with experience as well because you're an experienced coach. You can, you can pick things up on the floor that you, you walk past and you see this and you go, okay, we need to do this test. But what would your advice be for, say, less experienced coach and who's trying to get into the industry um, uh, I guess this is almost like the same question as what book should I read? Mm. But what, what's a good starting point for someone to understand, I guess, the elements of like just biomechanics and just how to execute lifts? Your anatomy. The first part that most trainers should start before they start doing courses or anything else is learn their anatomy. Yeah. I can't tell you how many people go to a course and you're talking about, you know, a lycus for sewers and, the attachment, and they have no idea what that muscle is. Yeah. Right. Um, so I suppose the first thing I would start with is personally anatomy yeah. and then try to work out from there. But I, I think it was Gary Vanderchuk. I don't know who said this, but um, it was like, at first you're going to suck and eventually you'll suck a little less and eventually you'll <laughs> suck so little that you're actually good. So yeah. I think my advice for trainers would to be start learning, understand that you're not tip top yet, mm. not get discouraged by that. And then just go through the processes to eventually get to a point where you can be at that level that you see someone, you know, do a lunge or something and you're like, cool, lateral line is likely out or mm. whatever it might be. Or they're doing a reverse lunge and you can go, cool, you've most likely got limitation in the big toe. Let me double check that. Cool. Here you got halicus limitus or rigidus or whatever it might be. And let's move your big toe. Cool. There's your lunge fix. Bang. Done. Yeah. 
Yeah, the, th- the thing that I see in, with a lot of coaches, especially coaches that have been in the industry for a while and they might have been coaching for, say, 10 years, but they haven't been educating themselves at the same rate as they're, they're working. And they kind you know of... why? See, they, they get that... They mistake, oh, I've been working in the industry for 10 years. I've got 10 years of experience, but... And they kind of get this ego and they don't have mm. that humility to actually ask for help. And I see a lot of coaches like that and they're just kind of stuck in that, just not getting better. The industry for me is like everything else. There's good doctors, bad doctors. There's good cops, bad cops. Um, mm. I think there's good PTs and there's not so good PTs. And then there's PTs that have different values within it. So some people are more ori- money orientated and there's nothing wrong with that. They probably help people on a far larger scale. So they're trying to run like massive boot camps or whatever it might be. And then there's people that are more clinical. Their values are being specialists or you know education. So I think within the spectrum of personal training, health and fitness, There's everyone with different values. And as a result, there's going to be all these different aspects to health and fitness. And with that, there's going to be both the good and the bad. So, yeah, I think the first thing that someone should do is understand what's motivating them within the industry. And if it's money, if it's free time, whatever it is, that's nothing's wrong with that. Your values are not better than my values, but understand what's motivating you Mm -hmm. and then understand how all these other things come together to make that thing better for you. Yeah. Does that make sense? No, completely. Yeah. Yeah. And so just just going back to to your studio here, what what would you say are like the overarching philosophies that or principles that you apply to to everyone who walks through the door? What what are the main fundamentals? The main fundamentals. Hmm. That's a very good question. Like, what's our actual motto? Is well, a little bit different. I, or mantra I know, is a bit different to I the philosophies you, that apply to everyone. Yeah, I know you've got a huge. Uh, hey, background. hey, Adam! Time and a place. <laughs> time and a place, buddy. <laughs> huge background. <laughs> All right. Yeah. In strength, and you love strength training. You know, predominantly, it's in in the name of your business. So True. why why is strength such a big part of what you do? Well, strength's a relative concept. Like, yeah. So when people, when I say strength, people think strength endurance, strength of mind. Um, oh, sorry. When I say strength, most people think maximal strength, right? But mm. like there's strength endurance, there's mental strength, there's um, speed of strength. So strength is a, an umbrella term. You know, strength technically equates to hypertrophy. This, you know, so mm. strength is the umbrella term for everything. Yeah. So that's why I use it. Okay. Not for yeah. the what most people think, which is the connotations in terms of maximal strength. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's a good answer. Hence why the, the motto is reveal your strength. Yes. See what we okay. did there? Yeah. I should have done a bit more research on that one. <laughs> <laughs> what are, what, what's, what's the demographic? So I mentioned before you get a lot of, you train a lot of coaches, but just t- talk about the people that, that come to you. Yeah, I used to pigeon. So like I had a business mentor that was um, essentially saying, know your niche, know your avatar, which I'm a big advocate for. Like you should know your avatar. You should know who you primarily want to train but i also feel i take on almost anyone now so weight loss clients rehab clients and that personal trainers we have a lot of combative martial arts jiu-jitsu mma muay thai Mm. karate but the reason that i like the umbrella is because i learn something from one that i can apply to someone else Mm. and i think that's it's that whole fear of becoming a jack of all trades you know a master of none whereas i feel there's always you should know your niche or the thing that excites you the most and mostly focus on that but it doesn't mean you have to throw the baby out with the bathwater, mm. which you know from a business perspective definitely helps the business but from a learning perspective like there's always things you can learn from someone else that you might in fast lesser values be able to apply to your your avatar your your niche yeah. market yeah so i don't think we have a specific demographic that i only allow in here having said that that we have a general rule, rule which is no dickheads yeah. yeah, I think that's a big thing that I will happily turn down a client if you are, for lack of a better way of putting it, an arrogant bastard. Okay. Yeah, so like if someone's, I found those people can infect everyone else. Yeah. So I'd rather have less people in a session or a class or whatever than have someone who's um, toxic. Yeah. If I can't problem solve that toxicity, which means like if you talk to someone and understand where they're coming from and what's actually motivating them to be like that and you can help them along that, awesome. If you can't and they're still kind of infecting the environment, then that's the only person that I wouldn't yeah. be keen to have on board. But you'd, you'd hopefully weed them out in the exactly. pre, pre-questionnaire. Correct. 
And has, has there been instances where you're just like... Yeah, sometimes not, you miss it. Yeah? Sometimes you miss it. Yeah. So, so there's like a bit of red tape and you've got to... <laughs> <laughs> there's a red flag and sometimes, yeah. Um, so the, the whole process, this is why I meet with pretty much every client beforehand. Um, yeah. So even if they're, they're working with one of your other coaches, you still interview them? Correct. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Correct. 100%. Okay. And with... Um, I'm just trying to think what I was going to ask you. Um, so re- referring out and, and knowing your, your scope of practice when... when I worked with you at ASS. That was a big part of um, working as a as a coach there. Is you needed to know your place. You needed to know what you can and can't say to the athletes. And I think it was there was a very strong sort of line drawn in the sand. What working here? What has it changed your ideas from scope of practice back then to now? Yes and no. Um, I I think this is the whole good cop bad cop thing. I know nutritionists that are very very good at exercise and i know excess uh, you know strength and conditioning coaches that know the nutrition or their psychology extremely well so i think there's always gray areas where you're allowed to go into it but you have you have knowledge there you're not just prescribing this goes back to the guru thing you're not prescribing something you read on google or someone told you that you did on a weekend course you actually have experience in this that you can share with the person but i I do think too many of us overstep our mark having said that i think it creates a fear barrier now where people are afraid to go into the other realm for fear of persecution or fear of overstepping their boundaries so the the magic thing is this always right which is it's the client's safety first that's the number one goal goal second so the, mm. the client's safety is the number one priority so if you think you're abiding by that or if you are abiding by that i feel there's shades of gray there that you can go into other realms i.e yeah. i'm not a qualified nutritionist i do a whole bunch of nutritional interventions with my clients yeah. I'm not a psychologist and I do not want to be a psychologist. I don't go there. I talk to people about what's motivating them, their values and their, their deeper why or what might be upsetting them in a, certain, mm. you know, yeah. in a block. Like how, how does your, your relationship and troubles at work affect what we're trying to ultimately achieve? So I think there's shades of gray and um, you, you do have to have knowledge to be able to yeah. go down that avenue. Yeah. And so what, what would be a classic red flag in terms of... Uh, I was talking to another coach about this the other day mm. and his probably biggest area that he will refer out is, is usually centered around emotional eating patterns and just that whole, uh, you know, weight loss cycle and, and being a coach, like I've experienced it myself in terms of people that I've coached before and I, I know the skills that they need or the, the principles that they need to follow and they know it, but a lot of times I can't help them. Is that something you've encountered yet? The answer is kind of in that. Like if, it's, if I feel it's outside my scope and I'm not helping them or if I've tried something and it's not helping, I'll refer. Yeah. Same with injury, same with whatever. And that, that's even limiting within a coach. Like if I remember the skill that I was talking about before, we got to that point where it was like, I'm not helping you as a powerlifting coach because I've never done it. I was like, you should go train with someone else, referring yeah, out. Yeah. And that's even my realm because it exceeded my limits. Yeah, yeah. So I think when it, as soon as it exceeds my limits or my knowledge then I have to refer out because I'm not helping the client. I'm trying to be selfish, hanging on to them for me mm. versus ultimately seeing their success. Yeah. So I, again, there's a, there's a gray area. Like, and the, the, everything's on a spectrum for me, which means like, say someone's got emotional eating, but we can sit down and talk about it. And they're like, cool, yeah, I never realized that the reason I'm emotionally eating is because I want to impress my friends. And so when they ask me out on a weekend, I'm only saying yes because I don't want to disappoint them because I'm worried about how they feel about me. Like if we sit down and they have a light bulb moment, that's a aha. And they're like, holy crap, I never realized that. Mm. Then that might be all that's needed. Yeah, because you're not, you're not prescribing anything. You're just making them self-aware. Yeah. And leading them to an answer rather than telling them. Um, and so it's, I think I'm pretty sure it was you, you, you spoke about when I was being mentored by you years ago about having a really strong referral network and having a team of guys that is, is that something you still hundred yeah. percent. So that's what I was saying. So we work with the guys from mind room in terms of sports psychology. We've even had them in here for talks guys. They are legends. So yeah, as soon as it out, then, you know, it's beyond my scope. We'll refer there. I use an osteo who's up here, Ben Stringer, who's the guy I've been using for years. Yeah. So all the rehab stuff that is outside my scope off they go but having said that people have got their own people which means it's like you don't have to go see my guy go see someone else yeah yeah, yeah. but i guess for you, if, if they see your guy then you have 
open lines of communication with them. Yeah, but some, like this again, this goes back to this, some good osteos, bad osteos, some good cops, bad cops. Like I find some physios are amazing, right? Mm. And, you know, they are great with communication. So I don't, I don't care who someone goes to. This goes back to the same thing. It's like, what's the goal? Get our pain. Awesome. If your guy is doing that in one to two sessions, go to your guy. Or your guy is telling clearly this is going to take this much this long this is what i think it is let's try this let's see what happens yeah yeah, yeah. So i don't mind who you go to yeah um so we're going back to your the demographic who comes here and in terms of results now i've seen just on your social media you've you train a lot of martial arts guys um you train a lot of powerlifters. can you just speak about i guess some of your results uh some of the good ones that you've you've had and the athletes you tra- coach here yeah um so it's like i mean in terms of accolades of you know athletes we work with people with australian representatives in wrestling and karate um pro mma fighters but like this is what i've learned one of my guys just a bit of a tangent here one of my mma guys came in the other day and he was about to get into the ufc and as a result someone was like one of the other people in this class was like who was a student here was like oh i suppose he's going to get priority now and i was like no like these guys your goals that you're doing a novice comp and someone's weightless goals is just as important to me because in here like my results for you is the most important thing i want you to succeed so i don't care if you're at a gold medal level or if you're at a, i just want to get fit and lose weight like as soon as you step in this door and as soon as i take the responsibility of looking after you like your ultimate success is the thing that motivates me mm. right so it's like yeah we work with some good people but we've worked with some good people at all levels yeah. So I think that's what's personally more important, yeah. just to steal from your question. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, it gets a bit, that's bit a more question. Heart, heartfelt. <laughs> Isn't it, A? Yeah. <laughs> Got brownie yeah. points. Exactly. <laughs> no, it's true, though, though. Like, legit. I just mean uh, that stuff's exciting and it's good. But what I've learned over the years is like when I, I love success, right? That's mm. why. Because what motivates me is success. And success for me and what means that I'm a good coach is results. So if you're getting results at the highest level or if you're getting results at the lowest level, right, whether it be like whatever, then it's results for me. So it comes back to what's important to me and what's important for me is results. Mm. So I don't care what level it's at, but I, I do want results. Yeah. Well, that's, th- that's what kind yeah. of gets I th- me out I think it, it gets also like glamorized if you've been like a personal trainer for a while and you've been coaching general population it's always that elusive like I want to work with the lead athletes I want to but as you know work, working with athletes most ath- athletes are poor and it's if you're just ca- catering mm. to to just athletes then your business models yeah. are there's a hole in it yeah but I, I think yeah. there's a myth like you've got athletes that are like specialists like if, you, if everyone's uh, read um Brett Bartholomew's book, Conscious Coaching. Like yeah. he'll talk like there's all the different types. You've got the specialists. I've got athletes here that are like black belts and amazing, but they, they just want to do their craft. They don't give a crap about SNC and they don't give a crap about any of this other stuff on the side. And then you've got general pop people that want to lose weights that are like soldiers. They just want to go, they want to work. Like and so I think at every level you've got those different personality types. So it's not about I used to think athletes are harder workers, and the longer I've been in the industry you got different personality types at all levels. So it's it's the same, same. It's about understanding those and just kind of getting those people yeah. where they want to go, why they came to you for. Yeah, so just moving into that that topic of conscious co- coaching, I've read that book, it's awesome. And Brett came out and spoke at ESS when we were there. Yeah, that's and right. And he's a really nice uh, in, inspiring funny. guy, funny guy, yeah. and, and just knows how to connect and control a room. 100%. Uh, what... For, for you as a coach, and it's something you get as you become more experienced, just the communication, and this goes back to giving advice to people because I get a lot of trainers and coaches that listen to the podcasts in terms of communication and how important it is uh, as a coach. What, what are, what are the, the areas that coaches need to be strong in terms of identifying like personality types, that sort of stuff? I, it, for most of it, it comes down to, what's the, the saying again? quoting a lot of people here it's what i do um (laughs) they don't care how much you know until they know how much you care yeah so i think for the vast majority of them it's showing and this is clients at all levels especially like weight loss clients and you know general pop fitness things give a shit hashtag give a shit right which Mm. is like when they see you doing those extra little things when you generally you're not just checking up on them when they come into a session but you're like hey how's your nutrition been this week what happened to that problem that we had like how's that going like and you're going that extra little bit of mile everyone loves that stuff at all levels of customer service Mm. so i think you know 
for the athletes of your question or at any level, I think showing that you generally and generally giving a shit is what most people look for as clients or athletes or however you want to kind of put put that yeah that's that's my thing that i found yeah and then in terms of compliance like you spoke about before you know athletes coming in they might be like a master at their sport but then you know they don't see the correlation Mm. with strength and conditioning what how, how do you coach that and how do you get them i guess interested and then and motivated in the same same as everyone else, but at, at a different way. So what I mean by that is ultimately what you want is buy-in. So mm. how you get buy-in for those people is understanding their sport and running a correlation for them. So one of the guys, young guys in here who's an up-and-coming jiu-jitsu guy, he's only up here because his jiu-jitsu coach told him to be up here. All he wants to do is roll on the mat. He doesn't see the, he doesn't care about lifting weights or any of that stuff. So, you know, when you're talking about when he's lifting and I'm going, think like a cross collar choke or something along those lines and you're drawing parallels, that will swap buys him in. Yeah, well, you're talking his language. You're talking his language. There you go. Yeah. But I think for everyone's got a different buy-in. But ultimately what you need is a buy-in for everyone, right? For some people, it's their family. It's more money, whatever it might be. That's taking like, for when you do, this is why we do values checking. I'm all about values at the moment, as you can tell. Yeah. But like, for a lot of people, health and fitness or strength and conditioning or being in the gym is at like the bottom of their priority list. They don't give a shit. They're doing it because they have to or they're doing it because they want to look a little bit better naked or whatever it might be. But we can run the parallel of this is how this is going to help all these other things in your life. Yeah. That's, that's when you get far more buy-in. But not just generically doing it, like generally doing it at a level that speaks to them. Yeah, well, it goes back to like the Simon Sinek model about, you know, understanding. Simon Sinek. Simon, Simon Sinek's the guy who wrote Start With Why. Oh, there you go. And he's, he's all, it's not, it's not, it's more related to business, but he just about everything, you know, equating it back to it. And that's going to give you the, the greater level of buy-in in terms of Love it. athletes or business or whatever it is that you're trying to get. Um, so next, so nutrition, I know, I know you're big on reading and um, increasing your, your knowledge and just Google. Yeah. That's all I do, buddy. That's all you do. <laughs> what what are you what are you into at the moment in terms of nutrition? I know you experiment a lot on yourself. Um, yeah, I've been lazy with it. At the, the moment I'm experimenting how to be lazy. Yeah. <laughs> Ice cream and pizza. I don't need that stuff, but I do have beer. Yeah. That's, oh, that's my okay. kryptonite. Beer yeah. and chips, hot chips. Oh yeah. kryptonite. <laughs> yeah. So what what principles like I I mean we've spoken about it this years and years ago, mm. but in terms of when you it's, it's different for everyone you're coaching, but say if you get an athlete in and it's performance-based, what, yeah. what are you looking for? Yeah, really, that's, that's, a, that's a good question, man. That's <laughs> a good question. Um, this goes back to what I kind of mentioned earlier, whereas we're looking for a one-size-fits-all or uh, it fits most people. Mm. And we know that's not the case. Which I mean, Let me just give you some examples. Like, you know, um, for most people that might want to just that are like quite healthy and fit that the people that we've got in here or females it might be more along the lines of like a a targeted or like a balanced like a zone diet where your your macros between proteins fats and carbohydrates are pretty much equal like a 40 30 30 something along those lines right Mm. whereas you've got people that are highly stressed right and extremely overweight where you might do like carb backloading at the end of the day so you put the carbs at the end of the day to help you know um, improve serotonin levels and basically help them sleep at night so what i've learned once again is you have to understand as many of these diets as you can low carb um, moderate carb true keto um, high carb and understand all of them and then once you get the individual in run through all these questions get to know them start with the why right seek first to understand and then to be understood Stephen Mm -hmm. Covey since we're doing a couple of his quotes today (laughs) Um, and then as soon as you've got as much information as possible then you know what diet to prescribe yeah because for a long time when I first got into this like I got into a lot of the Czech stuff initially and it was like healthy eating, don't have milk, don't have grains, do all that stuff. And I believe that for a long time and I believe there's validity to that, but it's not the full picture. It's as soon as you try to put the entire, what are we like seven and a half billion people into one category of eating, you've got a problem. Mm. It can't be done. It's there's flaws in that. And like, if you look at any good science, any good science is looking at individual people and riddling it down to specifics, i.e. athletes in the age of 20 to 30 that had a training background that were on whatever. Like that's good science. When it's generic, it gets lost. Mm. So to answer your question, again, I know they're not the the answers that people like, like saying here's specifics, but what I've learned with nutrition is to 
understand as much about these other diets as possible. So when someone walks through the door and I understand as much about them as possible, I can prescribe the right diet that's best suited for them. Yeah, yeah, it's a good answer. But there's no, there's no, uh, I guess just from a performance standpoint, because you always different coaches have different philosophies in terms of the the way they coach someone through into a, a nutritional program, mm. and. I think I think a lot of times people get it wrong and they're applying certain diets and like you said there's no one diet that fits all but ju- just to give you like a, a scenario if you had a a Brazilian jiu-jitsu guy walk in mm. and you know he had no perceivable intolerances to to any foods you know he's Anglo-Saxon guy what specifically how, how would you go on that and he was open to eating whatever it is you said yeah, so adherence, obviously, as we know, is our biggest driving factor that's actually going to get results. And this, this is the other thing. It's like, how much time have you got? A guy came to me, one of my um, girlfriend's friends basically came to me and he's got a wedding in two weeks. Like, I'm using an extreme keto with a 25% weight cut for him. Why? Because I've got two weeks. Mm. Like, that's not a sustainable diet. It's not even really healthy. No. But I've got two weeks. So I think, like, I'd love to answer your question, but, like, there's so many things... Yeah, yeah. You need to know what, how much time frame do I have? What are the adherence? What are the training times? Do they, you know, do they respond well to carbs? Do they process carbs fast or slow? They're fast metabolizers or fast metabolizers, slow or fast metabolizers of carbohydrates. So there's a lot of questions to ask, and that's, I think you can only do that well when you actually get in the background information. Yeah. You know, generically, if you have to use a generic approach, and I don't really want to, but I will. Um, yeah, I mean. I suppose for most people, the rule was, you know, eat well from Monday to Friday and enjoy yourself on the weekends and track your results and see as long as your results are progressing the way you like, moderate or change accordingly based on your results. I.e. body fat wants to go down and you had a big splurge on the weekend and your body fat didn't go down. You need to modify the next week and eat less. So your results are dictating what's happening. Yeah. That's as a more generic approach. Yeah. And so to to get specific in terms of... Uh, you mentioned before, like, you know, if they're intolerant to something, are there any, like, go-to, uh, like, whether it's people or tests that you do to work out yeah. specifically this person should be eating this because he answered this on questionnaire or mm. whether it, you did a hair and mineral test or you, you ran a food panel? What What's the protocol for that? Yeah, so most of that starts with questionnaires. So I was getting into blood chemistry work for a while and then I realized, holy shit, this is a big this yeah, is a big thing it's complicated. and I don't know <laughs> shit about yeah. it compared to what I'd like to know. Um, so that sort of stuff, if I do, this is where you work within your scope and then you know your limitations. And my limitations are not running blood work, not understanding that stuff and not worrying about that stuff too much. I work with what I understand. So for example, someone comes in, they're like, I've got bloating, I've got digestive issues, I just want to lose weight. First thing is you put on the table, go, cool, I think you should see a nutritionist, but it's up to you. And they're like, cool, I just want to lose weight. Or they might go the flip side and yes, I'm happy to do that. And then I'll talk yeah. to them and see what happens. Or they're like, no, I'm just wanna, I just want to train for now. I'm not too worried about it. Cool. Then I might go, what can you commit to? So let's take out things or do an elimination diet. But ultimately, you need full buy-in for this. Mm. Right? So there's, I suppose, again, it's just going what's actually going to suit the individual and how, yeah, yeah. how far can you kind of take your knowledge. Yeah. And and how do you find like I'm not answering your questions, but I'm like dodging your questions. You are you, you you're very good at coercing. Through. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm try- trying to answer them professionally though. I'm, I'm trying I'm trying to get some like some dirt, some like dirt, some co- controversial answers oh. here. <laughs> so more specifically, yeah, what- people love enemies. People love the enemy. Fat is the enemy. Carbs are the enemy. Enemy. I can't even say it. <laughs> yeah. Um, Gluten, you know, dairy. Yeah. Knee knee break squats and deep squatting and sit-ups and like people love the bad guy and that's the problem because as soon as you're looking for the bad guy it it might be very very true for the population group you're working with like you know carbs are bad because you've got people that have like high metabolic damage that really need to go on like a very low carb based diet which makes complete sense so therefore you think it's the right answer but then this new person walks in the door that's really good at tolerating carbs and now the whole thing goes out the window yeah so yeah people people love definitive answers yeah and i kind of mentioned this at the beginning because people want a definitive they want an easy way and this this limits your growth this limits your learning you just got to understand that you want to learn as much as possible so when that individual walks through the door you have the right answer for that person yeah 
Well, that's that's a good answer. There you go. Gotcha. What, what about <laughs> so going the back end of uh, which is always, oh, uh-huh. always a bit of a slippery slope. The back end. <laughs> but to- talking about <laughs> talking about supplementation. Don't look me in the eyes when you say that, buddy. <laughs> to- talking about supplementation, yep. and I think with personal trainers, and you're in like an influential p- position. Trainers get targeted to either promote or sell products, mm. but also you going into a gym. A lot of people, you know think because it's perception that you should be taking a protein shake or you should be taking some sort of multivitamin what's what's your i guess philosophy and overarching Mm. thoughts on supplementation risk first benefit yeah so i think the truth is when you kind of get into it most of us shouldn't be prescribing sups because we don't understand the full ramifications or cascade effect that that causes in a body having said that there's a risk to benefit ratio so fish oils like for example the risk of someone having adverse effects to fish oils is pretty low in the grand scheme of things mm. versus say now you're starting to supplement things like you know um fat burners or something along those lines like now the risk goes up so i think you have to first at least understand just well not at least understand your supplements um pros and cons well before you generically prescribing stuff and this is a really good uh, concept of this is this is the method versus principles a lot of personal trainers today are prescribing based on methods that they've been taught they don't ever take the time to understand the principles and the underpinning kind of physiology of the supplements that they're prescribing which is running into problems now it's not saying that some of these don't work really really well Mm. but you're going to have the outliers on any curve that don't respond well to something necessarily because it's not the right fit for them they don't need it yeah does that make sense yeah so our our kind of i suppose philosophy on it is when we have to start going down that route we're normally referring out if we're really prescribing but we also consider the risk to benefit ratio which means if someone's taking some super greens and they're taking some fish oils i don't think you're going to have adverse effects to that no versus now we're going down a hole yeah yeah um like xenoestrogens and we're trying to you know give you xeno blocks um, blockers or something along those lines yeah, yeah. because we think your estrogen levels are like that's 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 something i don't think you should be doing no unless you know your shit very well yeah and so but you'd be you know with, with your athletes but also weight, weight loss clients you'd be asked those questions all the time like, what, what what do you say to them in terms of hey john like should i be having you know just say the guy's trying to do whether it's hypertrophy or weight loss, yep. he asks you, should I be taking a protein shake after training? What, what's your answer? It happens all the time. So one of the young fighters in here last night was like, I want to take creatine. And I was like, cool, sweet, like, fine. Like, th- this is your risk to benefit. Is he going to benefit from it if he's getting, like, high red meat diet, which I know he's eating? Yeah. Maybe, maybe not. Like, some, there's a lot of science that says creatine can be beneficial. But remember, he's, he's in an endurance-based sport, Like right? It's three five-minute rounds. Creatine might help, but it sure as hell ain't going to help him, you know, it's not going to be the difference between night and day versus like looking at your training, looking at your sleep. It's, it's low frang- hanging fruit versus um, what people like as the quick, the easy fixes. So I think if you're not looking after your basic stuff really well, like your training volume, really big one, um, your recovery, all these things that we know, and then you're looking for creatine to kind of be that defining factor of yes now i'm making my gains or not i don't think that's going to happen yeah and a lot of times for that sort of stuff the pl- placebo is probably worth it in terms of if he thinks he's taking this it mm. making him stronger creatine's got i think it's nick Timolo, whatever his name is nick Timolo writes a really good he did a um there's a pdf a free pdf you can get on creatine um the pros and cons and the science behind it it was a pretty good read and from that like creatine's got some validity behind it mm. But this is what I was saying. If you're not looking after your low-hanging fruit, always go for the low-hanging fruit first. Yeah. So it's diet, the 80-20 recovery. rule. Like when we first, you, I would have spoke about the 80-20 rule where like 80% of your gains come from 20% of your efforts. Do the fucking 20 well, like real well. Do your training volume well. And like for or your recovery. For a lot of our clients, it's under recovery, not over training. Mm. Like understand adherence. How do you get buy-in? Like do that stuff well and then worry about the little supplements, the cherries on top. Yeah. And it's supposed to supplement a diet. It's not supposed to be the diet. Yeah. So how do I feel about like isogenics or any of those people? Fucking horrible. Yeah. 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 I have very few enemies in the game. 
that sort of shit would be one of them because it's it's not sustainable. Well, it might be sustainable for some, but for the vast majority of people, I doubt it's sustainable. Yeah. Having said that, if they can do it indefinitely, fair enough. It probably has some validity to it. In yeah. That. But at the end of the day, they're selling a lot of overpriced uh, supplements that aren't actually mm. that good. And well, make- I think some of them are pretty good. They've got some good names behind them. Like a lot of people see them as the villain. And I do just because it's the system. Here's, here's my problem with everything. Like we run a six week challenge here and a lot of people got like problems with Ultimate You and those people. And I, I watch people's Facebook like ripping them to shreds. And I'm like, you got to understand everything's got its place, right? And these guys have its place, but it's the education that comes along with it, which is not what most of these people are doing. They're saying, this is the answer. Our th- product is the answer. What they're not telling people is how do they come out of this stuff? How do they think, do things like reverse dieting? What do they do if they don't live like this indefinitely? Because we know 95% of diets fail within around about one to five year period. Why? Because people can't stick to them anymore. So I think all of these things can work as long as people are truthful about the pros and cons of what it is they're actually selling someone. Yeah, and it it becomes almost like natural selection. It's like you go there, there's people that do really well, they'll lose the weight and they might change their lifestyle. but then the bell curve, yeah. But they're they're not going to tell you, uh, you know, 80% of the guys who went through our program, Mm. you know, put on you know 110 percent nah. of the weight that they're lost obviously it's not you're not gonna sell it marketing. it's not sexy yeah but it's to be same. fair we don't do that like we've got people like i'll be straight up like not everyone in our program has their results like you're not marketing that stuff having said that that doesn't mean you're not doing a good program like and same respect to these guys it doesn't mean you're not good doing a good program out there what really comes through is when you hear the stuff where what happens to them after like mm. if you're not part of this program out you go see you later what i th- i think that's that's not a duty of care. That's, mm. that's not what our game is about. I mean, this is like, if you hear to generally, the number one thing is their, their safety and success. And people are blowing out and you're not teaching them how to come out of this and that these huge caloric deficits, like where they're eating, you know, between 1,000 to 1,500 calories a day is not sustainable. And the people can't understand what happens when they stop doing this diet. Like, I think that's, that's poor duty of care and that's, that's, neg- that's, that's not what we're about. No. No, and I mean, but it's it's in every business. It's not like everyone who goes to see a business coach who pays ten thousand dollars is going to turn into a, you know, ten figure like you know millionaire. Yeah, of course. Like, but they, yeah, they'll market the good stuff. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's what people do. That's marketing. Yeah, and what um, what was I going to ask you next? Um, so what? Just going back to. Um, mistakes was is there any uh, like big mistakes that you many you made early on that that have sort of or any pivotal ones that you can think of dude Um, so that (laughs) that girl for example was one that always stands out that was like a power lifter rent really far like often you think you're good because you have information information is not knowledge that's the big Mm. thing I could say like you think you know something because you've read a book and you understand about the energy equation or something on those lines. None of that means shit until you can apply that stuff and actually get results out of it and understand, you know, mm. how to problem solve. So that, that's one that definitely rings a bell. Um, and then a couple are where I thought for a long time that people should just be ready for change, which means people should come to me and I kind of like, why does this person not listen to what I'm saying? Like, Mm. this is why for a long time I didn't work with fat loss people or weight loss people because I was like, if these people aren't ready for change, I don't want to help them, right? This is why I want to work with athletes because they're here to do work. The longer I've been in the industry, I've realized that's actually not the case, but I've also realized it's our... It's our job to understand these outside areas and sit down with someone and go, why is this important to you? Mm. So I've lost some clients along the way because my understanding of those outside factors haven't been, I haven't taken the time to actually delve into them. It's Mm. just about, here's your training program, here's your nutrition, this is what you should be doing, best of luck. Yeah. And it doesn't, it doesn't work a lot of the time. No, if you're not like the psychology, psychology rules physiology every time. Yeah. 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 And so what, what now are you uh, focused on with your, your own development, your own learning? I am just enjoying the process again. For a long time, like the two years since I set up this place, I'm always doing courses, but for the last two years I've been, or year and a half, I've been doing business courses. So online business courses and um, gym-based or studio-based business courses. 
And that stuff's exciting, but now this is kind of the conversation we were having before. I got to a point where it's like someone came to me with a business opportunity the other day and was like, cool, let's expand. Um, let's take this, let's make this bigger. And I was like, I'm not really keen to do that, right? Because it means more work and it's not what's important for my values now. I'm in a place where I don't want necessarily, I love what's happening here, but what excites me is I was always working hard so I could do the things in life I wanted to do. So I could, you know, spend two hours at the gym just chilling and not worry about having to get into work. So I can go for walks on the beach in the morning, so I can go kite surfing and spearfishing and these sorts of things. And now, all I'm worried about now is making sure I get that stuff and going back to enjoying the learning instead of for the sake of it. So I'm just doing things that are inter like interesting mm. to me as opposed to worrying about um, having a succeeding specific outcome based thing yeah I think I think it's the big thing of like um, for a long time I'll be honest with you like especially when I was teaching when I was teaching I thought I had to be at a certain level which means I should have my own gym by now people should think this of me you know I should be working with these people and getting these results and as I've got you know older that stuff means far less to me now but your values change as you get older mm. um, and as you know you develop so I think what's important for me now is enjoying what I do generally fucking enjoying it like being excited to come to mm. work yeah and that's, so what, that's what gets me what, what are the aside from like coaching and uh I guess what what aspects you do enjoy about your business and what you do, the people, legit. Like I mean, some of these class, like I was talking about flow before. Like I come in here and a three hour stint can boost by in like what feels literally like thirty minutes, because mm. I'm I'm working around with the people, I understand what's going on, I know the people. It's a awesome environment. Like I, I love, I generally love coaching these people, which mm. I can't say has always been the case. I've worked with people over the years where you know i'm counting the clock that was a huge thing where i don't know if you know this if you're watching my facebook's ages ago but i was like i was pretty much going to pull the pin on the industry probably about just before i opened up this place oh really yeah so yeah. about two and a half years ago i was like i'm done with this because i was working in a shit environment i wasn't progressing myself and i wasn't un i wasn't following what was good for me i was trying to chase stature yeah and i wasn't enjoying it so yeah i think that's been the big shift at the moment. Yeah. And mm. um, what, what flipped the switch and then you did the 180 and opened up the place? This, this is um, what caused the switch initially was um, I listened to, uh, who was it? Uh, Dr. Ginger Campbell. I, I, it was someone, it was like a, she does the brain science pod, podcast or whatever it might be. It might be her or, I can't remember the podcast, but some dude came on and he was like, understanding fear and lack of action and mm. what you need to start doing is not be controlled by fear and fear of failure fear of failure has always been a big thing for me like i'll do something but what happens if it doesn't work and it doesn't you know people don't think this is me and this this awesome stuff doesn't happen and then he started suggesting what you do is yeah that's going to be bad so if i try something and i failed it yeah that's going to suck that's going to hurt but what's going to suck more is if you look in the mirror in 15 years time 10 years time and you go why did you never do it and that resonated with me massively. Like that was one of those moments where I was listening to him and like hair stuck up on the back of my neck and I was like, fuck, I need to start doing that. Yeah. And so what I started training, my, like getting into that side of stuff is going, how do you reword things or change your thinking so that fear no longer becomes the, the, the driver, dictating yeah. factor of what you can or cannot do. Yeah. So that, that's been the huge thing for me in the last two, well, this place hasn't been open two years, so year and nine months or whatever it is. Yeah. And, and if, if you would have advice to yourself when you first opened up what what, what would that look like because you obviously learn as you go with with opening up a business like this look i honestly don't think it would have been done much differently no. um yeah i'm pretty happy with the way it's gone like i had some hiccups it went well initially and then there was like a little drop down and that's what made me do a lot of these business courses um so yeah i don't think i would do anything differently because that's I don't know, it's cliche saying it, but that's like led me to where I am today and what I am. But like, yeah, this shit happens mm. for a reason if you want it to. Yeah. I don't, I don't believe in fate or anything like that, but I think it's how you start to deal with the situation. I'm glad, I'm glad it was not, you know, all roses and sunshine from the very beginning because it, it forces you to change. It forces you to grow. Mm. I think that went really well. That's a bloody good book that people should w read. Um, Mindset one? by uh, Dr. Carol, Carol um, Dweck. Yeah, Carol Dweck. Yeah. That's the one. F fix, that was another big thing that changed yeah. shit for me. F fix versus growth mindset. mindset. Yeah, yeah. Oh, awesome book. That was a good book. So simple. Like basically, it's one concept that she talks about for about nine hours. Yeah. But 
it's just so many different contexts that she yeah. puts it in. It's bloody awesome. And, and she uses a lot of examples with child development, yeah. which you can, you can see. And I'm, not that I'm a parent, but you know, I'd, I'd recommend that for any parents because it's like one of those things. It's like you can't you want to teach your kid growth mindset versus fixed mindset. Hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. Put that on your reading. It's on Audible. <laughs> there you go. There's Must a plug. Read. There's another plug. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We, we have to give you some affiliate marketing, marketing <laughs> points. Sounds good. With with your courses, so I know you, you've taught a lot. Uh, what currently do you, do you teach? What courses do you have on offer? So I'm running Coaching Chieftains, which is a 12-week. We've got added in a bonus week, which so it's 13 weeks. But it's a development course, and it's all the areas I feel personal trainers have holes in. So it's not going into one particular area like nutrition or just you know assessments muscle testing but it's like understanding your niche initially like what why are you here like what do you what not on earth but like in the industry what do you actually want out of this um how do you program for strength what are the mechanisms of strength hypertrophy or um anything uh, conditioning understanding aerobic capacity versus um aerobic power so it goes through these things but the the ultimate aim is to make better coaches that generally are happy about what they do but understand their shit a little bit more so they're not just methods but here's your principles kind of what we spoke about before and this is what i deem to be the eight the the 20 percent of the stuff that you should know so that's yeah. pretty much what the course is about yeah understanding the 20 percent that i deem to be the most important yeah and important. so so it runs for 12 weeks how, how does it work in terms it's of online at the moment so someone basically just contacts we have a phone interview and then okay. see if it's right for you and then yeah. The other option of that it can run as a hybrid, which means so you run through the online course and then you come in, which is basically like a miscellaneous day, which means what do we need to cover? What are the holes for you? Because instead of having a set system where it's everyone needs to cover this, it's like, what did you struggle with? Look, the nutrition was the hardest part for me or the muscle testing is often and the assessments. Muscle testing, a lot of people struggle with because visually versus doing kinesthetically, it's, it's a separation there. So people come in and then we run through that and yeah. that's pretty much how the two-day practical works okay yeah awesome cool so what's what's next for for the business and for yourself what are the Look, future i'm just enjoying it. it's been a like i said i've been working my ass off for the last year and a half like crazy days and it's just what if anyone's opened a new business or started a new venture they know exactly what i'm talking about whereas like i normally sleep like a baby and for the last year and a half like my focuses in terms of training or anything has gone out the window because i'm lying awake at night and thinking about like did I deal with that customer problem the next day and what am I going to do about this? So yeah. I've learned to let a lot of that stuff go in the last few six months or so. So I'm just enjoying the process at the moment. That's what's on the cards at the moment. But I think everything goes in um, you know, peaks and troughs. And at the moment, I'm just... I'm in maintenance phase at the moment. Yeah. And I'm enjoying maintenance phase. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I'm not cutting at the moment. The business is in maintenance phase, enjoying it, and then we'll see what happens next year. We'll see... Yeah. See how I feel after my little holiday. Yeah, well, it's it's summertime. It's good good to be in maintenance phase in summertime. Get my summertime. brown on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we're, we're coming to the end of the interview. I've got a couple of uh, like series of questions that I always ask my go for it. my guests. Up like so, um, so first ones. What's what's your all time? We, we might put this because I know you're an avid uh, reader and learner. But mm. what's your all time favorite training book? Uh, that that can be one, and then self-help or that genre or and uh maybe a nutrition as well okay so which one do you want first you pick okay so my so favorite training go training my favorite training book so, something that just like shaped you i think what shaped me initially in terms of training uh, i could say look i've in training, I love I love anatomy. So anatomy trains has been one of those ones. I think I feel a lot of people. It's one of those books that a lot of people buy and then never read or understand. Mm. But um, yeah, I spent a lot of time basically skipping all the shit at the beginning when he talks about the science. Like I was like, okay, I love science, right? But I was like, I'm not getting anything from this. So I stri straight to the trains and I was like, cool. Let's how learn how I can apply this. So like learning how the superficial backline or something along those lines connects and then working with someone on something that I thought might be the case like hamstring and seeing how that affects the back pain or whatever it might be mm -hmm. so that that's been one that I love playing with and I still play with now like I don't feel I've got my head around it nearly to the level I want so it's one that I constantly play with and um yeah mm. that that's been one that's stood out for me over the years yeah 
and self-help or self-help that that mindset one i think yeah that growth versus close mindset stuff's awesome and just anyone who wants to get into nlp as a whole like a basic course of nlp neuro-linguistic programming for those who don't know yeah. but yeah. um yeah i think that type of shit in terms of how the things that you self-limiting beliefs yeah yeah yeah, I think yeah. that's a huge one that a lot of that don't just serve us, but serve our clients massively. Yeah, how, just just off the question a bit, but more onto NLP. How does that? Because I've never actually I've I've read books, but I've never actually gone into the, like the the core structure. Mm. How has that sort of served you as as a coach and a communicator? Yeah, I learned so I first got into it from one of the courses that I did, and it was it was in depth. So I've got Paul Lissio, who's an NLP coach, doing the stuff on the coaching chieftains there's a plug for coaching chieftains lots there of plugs um, <laughs> but um yeah I, I learned a lot from that so like how to structure that for clients and running basically through their blocks for lack of a better way of putting it and that's that yeah. stuff that i spoke about before like trying to link stuff back to how does x help how does you know health and fitness help your financial goals or whatever goals getting yeah. by in yeah. um so yeah the big premise i suppose that's that's where i kind of learned a lot from um, so, and a shout out to Lynn, that's the business course that I did, the online Lynn business Trin, yeah. course, who had um, Geordie do all the NLP segments. Okay. So, there, there was some nuggets in there. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, nutrition. So, we did tr- training book, self-help, nutrition book, anything? Ah, nutrition. Nutrition's a big one, eh? Uh, probably, um, what's it? Do, 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 do. Book, 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 book. I want to say, I don't know, it's such a mix of things. Like that Robert Sapolsky book in terms of understanding how stress affects nutrition, that mm. had a lot of, lot of aha moments for me, what, like hi- causing people to become hyperphagic and then rapid yeah. eating. Like if you control stress, now we can help control appetite. So, What was uh, the title of that? Was that? Uh, why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers. Oh, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, I don't know. Like I learned a lot from John uh, Precision Nutrition, which I'm sure a lot of people have done, the level one. I never actually did the course. I just bought the book. Mm. Um, but yeah, there's, there's a lot of good stuff. I mean, whew, yeah. yeah. There's, there's, no, there's no standout. <laughs> too many. Uh, it's off topic, but favorite movie? Ooh, favorite movie. Shawshank Redemption. Yeah, it's a good answer. And your friend, the only man I know who crawled through six miles of shit and came out clean on the other side. <laughs> Sweet movie. Oh, well, there we go. We got a quote, <laughs> a quote as well. That was going to be a, a good no- movie, man. Yeah. Uh, Classic. Favorite cheats meal? Beer well, and chips. I'd say, yeah, beer beer and chips is probably right up there, eh? Yeah. On a Sunday, on a Friday afternoon. Sun yeah. And sun. Um, so going back, uh, quotes or phrases that you'd say on a regular basis oh, and in, in your coaching prowess. Uh, yeah. yeah. My, my favorite one, you know, I love quotes, but um, my favorite one is when the Dalai Lama was asked, what surprised you most about mankind? He answered, man, for he sacrifices his money. He sacrifices his health to make money. Then he sacrifices his money to recuperate his health. He is so anxious about the future, the result being he lives neither in the present or the future. He lives as if he is never going to die and then dies never having really lived. Like for me, that's like, I love that because it's got three premises in it, right? Which is the golden rule should be health before wealth. Live in the present, right? And do things like um, live as if you're never going to die. So do things, don't, don't live in fear. So the three mm. things that we've kind of covered today, that's, those are the three premises that I kind of work away from that. Health before wealth, um, live in the present, and then don't let fear control you. Yeah. And if, th- this is a bit of a deep one as well. If you, could be, if, <laughs> if you could be known for one thing and say at the end of your career, what, what would that be? I think for a long time that mattered to me. And like I've got a lot into religious talks at the moment. Like I'm, you know, I, I just love learning. So I've got into a lot of like um, atheist versus religious debates at the moment. Yeah. And like that's got me thinking about a whole new realm of stuff. Have you, have you read uh, Jordan, Jordan Peterson? I, I watched his talk the other I haven't read his book. Um, and he's... Uh, was it the 12 Steps, yeah? 12 steps. steps. But just like I've listened to him on several podcasts. Oh. He's on the Joe Rogan yeah. podcast recently. And just the, some of his concepts like make you rethink like... Totally, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and he's really articulate. Like it's just well, like it draws you in. He's good yeah. as well. But anyway, that stuff... Um, yeah, that stuff's got me thinking that I don't care too much about my legacy. Yeah. Like for a long time, there was something that I, like, what will people think about me? And what is this? Like what yeah, matters? Yeah. I think 
this goes back to the things before, like being happy, being in the prison and feel like I'm doing the best that I can do, that I'm constantly, imp- my big thing is I want to be known as, I suppose if I had to, is someone who's constantly improving themselves. Yeah, well, that's, that's a valid, good answer. Thank you, Adam. <laughs> I appreciate that feedback. <laughs> <laughs> so the last last uh, rapid fire one is if, if you could give yourself advice, whether it's 10 years ago, six months ago, 15 years ago is there any advice that that you give yourself at the start of the industry should have partied less yeah <laughs> spent too long doing that but um no i don't i, I don't think so like no no I, i'm really glad like everything that's happened in my life both good and bad like i'm really glad it happened because mm. yeah it's so cliche to say that's what made me but like i'm happy with who where i am are. yeah and where i am so i'm glad with the process i wish i had bought a house sooner mm. but that's oh, well, maybe that could be your advice. <laughs> Buy a I don't house. think it's that important, but yeah, maybe that's it. Yeah, this um, candy. Oh, my teeth. Yeah, I ate way. Actually, that's a that's one I'm gonna tell myself. Yeah. I ate way too much candy as a kid, so yeah. like sugar and I like teeth and fillings falling out when I was like 18 years old. Yeah, that sucks. So um, yeah, eat less sugar. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Screwed my teeth up big time. What uh? So finally, where, where can people get in contact with you and find out about what you do? To plug for yourself sure js strength performance um dot com not dot com dot au so just dot com yeah so you can either get all my contact details are on there so um talking about the coaching chieftains that i was doing before and contact number if you're looking at training and our web address and whatever else you need so if you need to get hold of me that's where you get hold of me yeah there's also instagram and facebook pages if you want to follow them which are ironically just js strength performance okay who would have thought well i'll put all those in the the show notes what is there um, any final parting words or actions for the, the listeners or anything you want to leave oh. us with? Any pearls of wisdom? Don't eat yellow snow. That's all okay. I've got. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, on that note, we'll, uh, we'll, <laughs> we'll end it. Thanks, uh, thanks for agreeing to do the interview. It's, no been, worries, uh, it's been fun. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Ciao.